I'm John Hanning from Archimedes Aerospace, and I'd like to introduce our team here uh, who have participated in this project from the beginning. Uh, standing up first is Jason Cooper, our flight director. He was the team lead for the build of the Sea Skimmer Unmanned Aerial Research Vehicle. Standing up next is Tony Hoffman, our um, Unmanned Aerial System Design Engineer. He was the team lead for the cruise uh, participation itself and was the UARV pilot and instrumental in the testing and configuration of the autopilot that we used on board uh, the flying wing. In the 2012-2013 intern, Robert Barlow, uh, <laughs> whose skills uh, continue to amaze us, uh, we find out more each, each time. Uh, <laughs> Robert is a high school student at uh, Twinfield High School in Plainfield, Massachusetts. And the story of how he Vermont. found Vermont. 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 You can do Vermont. Um, there is a Plainfield, Massachusetts, however. Um, but the story of how he found us, uh, we can discuss further um, over lunch. But Robert's role was to assist uh, Tony on board the ship as the observer, part of a two-person uh, uh, flight crew. And as uh, preparation for that, Robert also developed a digital object model of the Sea Skimmer UARV, which you can see in the flight simulator out on the table out on the outside. So, yeah. okay. Archimedes Aerospace is a company that does inquiry based remote sensing. We are not scientists ourselves, we are technologists, tool makers and aerospace educators. Most of our work is done in agricultural non-point source pollution prevention, agricultural water quality, but we also tend to work across disciplines and across scales. Most of the time, oceanographers and soil scientists and agronomists don't tend to talk to each other. But we do, we get a lot of good cross-fertilization ideas uh, going back and forth. We also like to work across scales. Um, in this instance, we have the, we are be working at uh, the nanometer level in satellite imagery and at the nautical mile scale um, in supporting um, the NBC crews. We are industry affiliates of Vermont Space Grant Consortium, and a big uh, goal for us in our collaboration with SEA is to bring space resources to the assistance of of ocean science. And <clears throat> before we begin, I, I want to express our deep thanks to the staff of SCA, um, the crew and the scientists aboard the Kramer, and especially the students who accepted our flight crew as their own shipmates, and we hope you understand that they worked as hard as you did. <laughs> <laughs> we know very much how hard you have all worked. Okay, so we'll begin. One of the questions that Amy and I have been discussing is that while there is satellite imagery available, uh, the study for sargassum doesn't tend to show the kinds of sargassum uh, that SEA has been collecting data on for years. This is Maris satellite imagery um, analyzed by Jim Gower and uh, Stephanie King from uh, Fisheries and Ocean Science Canada and they have been looking at sargassum movement from the Gulf of Mexico into the Atlantic and using the, uh, the Maris satellite, which flies in on an European Space Agency platform. And a key issue with this is the, the resolution of the Maris data in that it has a 1,200 meter pixel resolution. So if your sargassum mats or windrows are large enough or larger than this area, they will show up on Maris data. If they are not, they may very well be present, but they will not be shown on the satellite image. 
So Amy's suggestion is that we put the whole kind of conclusion up front, because it's close to lunch, and everybody just wants, wants to get um, input here. He said, much sargassum data collected by SEA is not in the size visible to satellite data. And this has to do with the low spatial resolution, uh, 1,200 meters um, along the ocean. Maris can see at a 300 meter resolution along uh, uh, coastal areas, but the ocean uh, size is much smaller. Uh, other issues for satellites are obstructing cloud cover, sun glint, and in this case, a satellite takes three days to um, revisit the same site on, on the Earth. So if you combine the, uh, the three factors of cloud cover, sun glint, and where the satellite is at any, any given time, you may not actually have that tool available uh, to cover the area that you are trying to visit. So a ship-based unmanned aerial research vehicle should offer SCA the capability to see much smaller sargassum concentrations. And to do it in the inquiry-based remote sensing <coughs> method of here's a topic that we want to find out on, let's go out and get it ourselves with a tool that we can use and understand and operate ourselves and not be the passive recipient of data from other platforms that were designed for other purposes that may not be available for our, our needs. In this case, we could broaden the observation window that SEA is, is currently using, uh, the one meter uh, by <coughs> uh, one meter wide uh, the Newston troll, which is done twice a day, um, 50 nautical miles apart, and six minute visual observations of sargassum done every hour. This is the optical visual method SEA has been using with great success for quite some time now. So UARV is just going to expand that, augment that uh, by being able to photo document sargassum structures as they are found uh, uh, perpendicular to the ship's track. We'll be able to see clumps, windrows, and mats and using, instead of the very low resolution of MARIS satellites, we're using a high definition, high resolution camera, um, which can resolve objects uh, by the square centimeter. We can see under cloud cover, we can change the orientation of the flight of the UARV to avoid uh, sun glint, sun angle problems. It's a very high re repeatability sortie rate. You can turn these around, uh, going out to the targets, coming back to the ship, changing batteries, draining out the water, changing out the SD card for the camera, send it back out again. You can exploit the situation as it appears to you. If you're seeing more sargassum of the type that you have not encountered before, you have the opportunity to capture more of it. Finally, the best thing is that there will be a GPS coordinate embedded in the image, which is based on GPS uh, track log from the autopilot. These can be used uh, as remote sensing training sites in that individual coordinates where Sargassum was definitely located and identified. You can take those positions back and look at larger satellite area scenes in the past and the future and it adds value to the satellite platforms. Okay, That's the gist of it. We could all break for lunch now, but I've got some really great uh, <coughs> photos and images uh, to show you. So this was uh, based from a um, SEA slide showing the different structural um, distribution of sargassum, starting from the far left. Um, at the millimeter side, fragments. Uh, one on the very top to the, to the left, these are uh, clumps. Going off to the very center, these are uh, occasional windrows and scattered clumps. Moving to the one meter size of windrows that are contiguous. And finally down into the uh, 10 meter size or greater, this is a spot that Maris can definitely pick up. Yeah, I can actually see that. What's where's our laser? I have the laser. 
this area here, which you're actually seeing much more concentrations of this. Maris can't see this, but the UARB can. So the chronology of the sea wings is that we've been involved with SCA since 2010. Uh, came to visit Eric uh, back in 2010 and asked him, do you use unmanned aerial vehicles? Well, we have remote operating vehicles. Uh, would you like one? And he said, yeah, okay, that'd be pretty good. And I was expecting your, your usual thing is about an 18-month development cycle. And Eric said, well, the ship's leaving in 12 days. What, what can you do for us? <laughs> well, the miracle workers here designed, tested, uh, designed, fabricated, and tested a small 34-inch uh, wingspan flying wing called the Sea Swift, which is in someone's office, in Amy's, office. Amy's <laughs> office, we can bring it out now. We brought Giora Proskurowski, okay, good, pronounced that, that, that correctly, out to Vermont for some very uh, short-term intense flight training, including how to land this into a soccer net, <laughs> and she succeeded, and then that managed to get to sea, and Chris and uh, Giora actually got it to work and, and fly, and we have some very uh, wonderful, dramatic photos of uh, <laughs> flight tests that were going on. We gave specific instructions uh, to land into the wind to slow the progress of the wing into the net. We got an e sheepish email banks back saying, yes, we know. And the thing went through the net, downwind, nothing but net, <laughs> over the deck, into the water, and uh, we confirmed that the ditching procedure worked perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that let us know that what we wanted was a wing that would land in the water, be waterproof, uh, use that as a feature, not a bug, but that the flying wing concept was definitely the way to go because the wing was strong enough to handle the winds offshore, and it could sprint upwind perpendicular to the ship uh, to the extent of visual range, turn around, cut the throttle to about a uh, quarter speed in a very stable photo platform. And that's proven uh, successful since then. So after that, we started working on an improvement with a larger wingspan called the Sea Sparrow Mark I. This was the um, first one designed specifically in water, not in net. It had a waterproof power supply and an avionics <coughs> box and proceeded from there uh, the following year to develop the Sea Sparrow Mark II, which had a giant 75-inch wingspan, um, which we have tested with an autopilot, and we have videos we can show of our test flights on Lake Champlain. This model has uh, such low wing loading that it's capable of thermaling. You can turn the power off and it acts like a glider. So in very good uh, wind conditions, this can stay uh, aloft for quite some time. So we thought we were going to use the um, Mark II hammerhead, uh, but then realized that with people who did not have the, the skill level to operate it, we'd probably need a catapult to launch it. And with the, just the time constraints for that, we were gonna go with a slightly smaller size so that we could meet the deadline this time. Uh, in this case, it was not two months. Two months, okay. <laughs> I'll just say that from the the date, January 28th, when I first gave the initial presentation to the uh, Sargassum Science team here at SEA, to August 28th, when our flight team disembarked at um, Bermuda, that exactly 90 days had elapsed from first concept to completed sortie and return. So our goal is to learn in a, what NASA calls the mission rehearsal process <laughs> to gain the um, technology testing and uh, testing of training and, and procedures so that we can support the 2015 Sargassum crews <coughs> with a modified uh, Sea Sparrow which will probably have uh, a catapult launcher of, of some type. Okay. Um, the Sea Skimmer itself is an expanded polypropylene uh, foam airframe, again designed to float. I think at some point we will need a plimsoll line <laughs> on the side because uh, it floats high on its marks as, as you'll see uh, later on. 
Uh, in this case, we had to design a custom um, waterproof case for the battery, which is uh, formed here. All this wiring is for an electronic speed controller. And this here, really the heart of the airframe, this is the Ruby Autopilot, developed by our autopilot uh, supplier and collaborator, a company called You There in Malden, Massachusetts. And this is a complete um, landing system in a gumstick computer. We have videos showing that this will automatically land an RC aircraft with the controller box set down on, on the ground. There's no hands for, for the pilot. It will do this in a 40 knot crosswind. It will put it at your feet. In this case, we, we were quite confident that it would return to the spot for landing close by to the ship. In our inquiry-based remote sensing work and uh, service learning classes, we hold up a GoPro Hero camera. We ask how many students know this. About two-thirds of the hands go up because it's a very common recreational camera. We found this to be quite helpful for us in our uh, remote sensing work and it has uh, both still photo and video capabilities. Launching, uh, the students will remember the kind of strange yoga thing that we did with moving the things up uh, down. That was to calibrate the onboard sensors and the autopilot so that it would fly in the uh, correct direction. Uh, the ship's position would be entered in the GPS for the return to home <laughs> function. And the camera would be set to auto shutter in the still photo mode every five seconds. There is an, uh, another photo that was shown of Robert holding uh, the wing up. He's doing what's called the waiter's toss. Waiter carrying big trays. We just want to give it that kind of javelin forward motion, uh, keeping your hands well clear of uh, the prop. Uh, the pilot, in this case Tony, uh, would be flying on uh, the manual control for launch, and then would, would switch to either autonomous flight at, at a planned altitude of 100 meters or lower or uh, use the, uh, the autopilot aided mode. Which you can see here, uh, Amy, uh, Jason, uh, the captain, uh, Ravi Struan, all had, had a uh, chance to fly the aircraft in aided mode where if they got into trouble, they could press a panic button, it would go into an, an orbit or return. But the real value of the Ruby autopilot is the stability of flight motion so that a lay user feels like I can really control this technology. When it has a camera like the GoPro on board, you're taking remote sensing concepts and making them <coughs> available and understandable to the people who will use them in the field. And on the right is a view from the ship, which um, I don't think has been done before. We're quite pleased with that. Okay, recovery, again landing in the water, this is a feature, not a bug. Um, <laughs> here is uh, uh, the sea skimmer uh, performing as designed uh, after about a 20 to perhaps longer flight duration depending on the lithium polymer batteries on board. Pilot will return the UARV to the ship, it's approaching to, from the up, upwind side, starts the water landing sequence, it can be either manually or an autopilot control. And Tony's determined that a 150 feet it was a pretty good, safe standoff distance to bring it within uh, close enough range for the recovery boat to land it, but to avoid mass rigging and uh, the wind eddies. So when the launch picks it up, it's returned on board, shake the water out, vent uh, any water in the pitot-static tube, change the batteries, change the SD card, um, let the motor cool off because it's been op operating quite a bit, um, and in about 10 minutes, it's prepared to fly again. So if you are encountering more sargassum or more plastics debris in the area and you need a wider picture, you can just keep launching this thing and bring it back. So what do we do with the photos? These are natural color images from the GoPro. We just picked one as an example. See the sun glint on the upper right-hand side here? 
The next slide over to the right shows the enlargement of the sargassum target. In this case, in the main picture, that's the target there. And there's the enlargement. So we use a very basic image analysis tool in our agricultural water quality protection work called AgPixel. And in this case, we produced a uh, false color composite uh, using the green-blue algorithm. So green minus blue divided by green plus blue uh, with an assigned purple false color. It gave us a bit more contrast. It's kind of hard to see here, but uh, the target is down there. Enlarge this, and now we have something that's a bit more visible, and we're able to get a very basic spectral picture of the blue, green, and red band values for this. One thing I want to point out, the difference between satellite um, atmosphere, or over atmosphere re reflected values, the spectral radiance is different from that underneath uh, the atmosphere, but GPS coordinates are the apples to apples comparison. So if you are positively identifying, yes, this was indeed a small mat of sargassum, and you have the push pin in the map that shows where that was done. All set past and future satellite imagery scenes can be evaluated for their much larger uh, image capture of, and other sensors of sea surface temperature, ocean color, wind speed, wind shear, all the factors that might in fact be aggregating or dispersing sargassum, you will know where they were and then can go back and use those tools in a new way. So from that with AgPixel, we just did a very basic um, histogram of the pixel brightness values. So it's quite high in the green bands followed by the red. Uh, this is not the kind of um, detailed image analysis. Uh, we would do use a, a, a software package like Envy or Airbus uh, Imagine to do that on shore. But AgPixel is something you could put on the laptop, have on the ship. And at some point, if you could identify, well, we know we've got um, fluotans or natans. Can we see even a very small spectral difference in red, um, blue, and green values? So we had a really high-tech method of determining the size of the mats we're looking at. We uh, got a picture of the Zodiac launch, which is uh, 12 feet long or 3.66 uh, meters. And we counted the pixels in the picture that make up the, the length of, of the launch. And lo and behold, this particular sargassum clump averages uh, 16 to 18 pixels across just under 61 uh, centimeters, or about half a meter wide, or um, two feet for those of us who still think in acres, furlongs, bushels, <laughs> something like that. So we, what we have is a clump not a mat, and certainly not a windrow, but it gave us an idea of what could be seen. So you go from 1,200 meter resolution to half a meter. That's a big uh, data gap that we feel that UARVs can fill. Lastly, um, we wanted to put this in the context of the ship's track, which is in the red. Uh, just faintly seen, uh, which was also shown in the students' previous slides, the ec uh, economic exclusion zone, EEZ, around Bermuda. So our second UR UARV flight, uh, 23rd of April, occurred just uh, within this zone. And this just has the um, uh, latitude, longitude, grid, of, uh, uh, geographic coordinates. One thing about image analysis and uh, remote sensing in general, it does not tend to be lay user friendly. And many times uh, data is in uh, proprietary packages that only the remote sensing scientist is uh, familiar with and comfortable using. So one aspect of inquiry-based remote sensing is that you want to get data in a widely understood and widely used formats such as uh, virtual globes like Google Earth or NASA WorldWind so that the data that you've just captured can be shared with other uh, policy makers um, and other nine science personnel. So in this case on the right hand side I've just overlaid a Landsat 
uh, seam boundary and seam center grid. Uh, so a similar uh, swath track of the Maris satellite, uh, which could be found from other sources, could be overlaid on this so that in this case, we know not only the geographic coordinates of the UARB flight, but we know that it was in Landsat World Reference Grid, Path 6, Row 40. <laughs> that was the address of that little sargassum clump at that time in, uh, <coughs> of that flight. So at this point, uh, if you have specific questions about the build of the UARB or actions on the crews, um, our panel of experts is standing by. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it looks like this is pretty exciting development from uh, the plastic screws that you described earlier. Um, I had just two quick questions. One is, were you trying to um, match up the flight times with the satellite overfly? It sounds like you know there's a pretty limited window when the satellite might be passing over the flight area. So, were you actively trying to do that, and is that would that help for the idea of um, referencing uh, in the future? Uh, the answer in the future is yes to both. At this particular cruise, we're not trying to match any satellite overflight. This is really more focusing on, on a, as a flight test function of a new prototype. Um, the Sea Skimmer had not flown anywhere except uh, in someone's side yard before it um, <laughs> went out into the ocean. But definitely for the future, we would be using um, software like Satellite Toolkit or the French uh, Visio Terra uh, Satellite Tracker, which basically is an application that shows the swaths uh, and the nadir ground track, the footprint of the satellite at any particular date or time. So yes, we could anticipate when satellite availability would be present along the ship's course and whether it has the bands uh, desired to see. Uh, the target organism. Can I add to that for one second? Chris, we were very, we actually only got two flights in on the leg from San Juan to Bermuda um, because of weather. And so the, the UARV could have flown, but we weren't comfortable deploying a small boat to pick it up. <laughs> and uh, so, so we were able to get two flights. And, and unfortunately, the days that we got flights, there was barely any sargassum around. But that's what was pretty exciting to see that we could get a small clump of sargassum find it and, and help us understand the distribution pattern. But we are currently on our boats limited by the ability to pick it up. There is a, a potential to capture um, a UARV on board with a special type of netting. Uh, there are different designs for this in, in, in uh, process, but uh, from the, the standpoint of being able to have repeatability uh, to be able to launch and then land in the water and have just basically any of the SEA staff, uh, particularly deckhands, mates, and engineers being able to understand, maintain, and, and operate this. We know very well that the students are way too busy to take on a whole new task for this. But if we could give you a tool that would put a pin in a map and link what you saw from your Newston trawl and hourly ob observations and match that to larger satellite scenes, uh, we think we would have given you a great gift. Yes. Have you thought about developing an ROV to pick up? <laughs> I think you should <laughs> ask that. <laughs> we, we have, uh, 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 believe me, we, we have. have. Uh, <laughs> Tony and I are notorious for notebooks full of ideas, and Tony currently has several ideas just to do that. Um, and we, we actually, on the way down here, you know, five hours down from Vermont, that's pretty much what we talked about. So, yeah, we probably have three or four ideas now so that um, the, the, um, the Zodiac boat won't be necessary so that we can bring it right up to the boat, use some sort of hook and, and have it um, to simplify it. So a lot more uh, flights could have been made and possibly a lot more sargassum detected. So, yes. 
Yes. A um, couple questions, really interesting stuff. I'm curious why you went with the fixed wing design as opposed to like a quadrocopter or something that might be able to just take off and land right on the boat, if that, if it was a weight issue or waterproofing issue or um, range? All, very good question, all, all definitely technical difficulties. Um, the game with the fixed wing is endurance and the amount of area that it can cover. It's vastly larger with a fixed wing. Um, and this, the other side of it is safety. Um, the, a boat in the ocean is what we found to be one of the most hostile environments for <laughs> electronics. So um, trying to land something that is essentially a blender um, on a pitching, rolling boat with lots of people it, it's a little dicey. I, I want to avoid it. So I'm not saying that it could be done in the future, um, but um, because we have a uh, much larger range with a fixed wing and because we can just ditch it in the ocean, um, you could ditch uh, a, um, a multi-copter in the ocean as well. You can make them waterproof, um, but your range is severely limited. Time in the air is severely limited. Uh, battery technology keeps changing, um, and that might change in the future, and we might say, hey, this, this isn't so bad. Maybe we'll have some sort of remote platform that kind of hangs off the side of the boat, and it's, it keys in on that and lands there. Who knows? But uh, for, for right now, uh, it's safer, and we can cover more ground with the fixed wing. Okay, sir. Yeah, I was really impressed with this, but I was wondering, if you choose to use a, a commercial, like, visible light camera to capture the images, have you considered looking at other bandwidths, like infrared or, or others that we have. pick up the vegetation? Mm -hmm. um, we're currently researching a, a couple of different cameras that are small enough for our um, aircraft. Um, we've actually modified our own, just bought some off-the-shelf small cameras and modified them to see uh, near infrared um, and put uh, a duplicate camera with uh, visible light right next to it and then flown that over some vegetation to see um, you know, what we could capture, how good was the quality just from off-the-shelf components. Um, it's definitely something that we're looking at, and um, we have, again, many ideas written, many notebooks about <laughs> how we're going to deploy that um, out, of, out of sea. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is the endurance of these? And I'm just wondering you, if the coordinates you're putting into it are based on your current ship position. Is there a way to shift it over time? And my curiosity is, this is an amazing tool be great to be able to get uh, an idea of the distribution, the size distribution of the sargassum mm -hmm. over a specific uh, area as large as possible. Yes, sir. Could you speak good to the autopilot? Um, well, uh, basically the what we do is, or when we were on the ship, we did a home position. And uh, as everybody knows, when you're in boat too, you still move. Uh, I think we were uh, just outside of Bermuda, 80 nautical miles. We moved 28 nautical miles east while in Hope 2 overnight. So that home position no longer is home to the aircraft. Uh, so we are developing uh, some stuff with you there to see if we can't position that and move that so we get that closer to the, the home position where we are when we end the flight duration. Um, so Ruby has a ground software. Again, we're, we've got a multitude of ideas because being on the ship, gave me uh, a, a better perspective than I'd ever be able to, to do from land um, of how we're going to change things to make this easier for scientists and gathering data. So I, we had a small sample of the data you guys saw, but the data that I retrieved from actually being there and using <coughs> and flying it uh, was invaluable. So um, does that answer your question? Uh, What's the so range? I mean, how long can it stay out? How much we, territory of sea space um, can it see? The, the smaller the unit, the lower the payload, so the smaller the battery. Um, in this case, we were probably safe, safely running a 10 to 15 minute flight, um, just based on the winds that we had. Um, but they can be increased based on the wingspan and our payload. We have the, the third rendition uh, aircraft that we made. Um, the one that John had mentioned um, being so light that actually it's thermal. Um, that one, we actually did a test one day. We were using off-the-shelf batteries, cheaply made batteries actually. Um, we just, that's what we had handy that day. And we flew it for 40 minutes. So it can be done. Um, I've seen aircraft that can fly well over an hour. 
Um, it's a matter, it's a balance of weight, um, size, as you know on the ship, very, very small spaces to hide things. Um, <coughs> you know, and what you can handle on, on a pitching rolling uh, boat. So we, um, we have to balance both the size, the payload capabilities, and endurance and come up with something that will work for us. This, this aircraft here, we, we made it as small as we did because um, not only was there a time crunch, but um, the, the larger version that we had, we, it, was, it wasn't completely waterproof yet. Um, we were still experimenting with some versions of that. And for time and space concerns, we chose the size that we chose. And that one was limited to you know maximum of 15 minutes, depending on wind. A single aircraft is a trophy. Two aircraft is really one. Three aircraft is a possibility. Four aircraft is a capability. And having a flight of four aircraft aboard the ship, being able to operate them one after the other, going out different vectors, different orientations, coming back, landing, uh, having the camera or sensor data downloaded and recorded. By the time you've recovered one, the other has had a recharge battery and is able to continue. And the whole point of using commercial off-the-shelf components, RC model aircraft uh, designs, is to make this as understandable, reliable, and simple as, as possible. Um, government designed drones with a, require a very large logistics tail. They're all built in uh, mil-spec uh, conditions. They are extremely expensive. And our whole purpose is, is really to enable the citizen scientist to use tools that are available and comprehensible. Yes, sir. Excuse me, John. Sorry, I have to go off, but we have to get one last person. Okay. Any other last question? Yes, far back. Um, are you, uh, do you anticipate any sort of usage for uh, possible uh, surveys, especially in response to oil spills? Can you, can you, can you be asking about for oil spills um, using these onboard vessels to get the data? Um, yes, it, it could certainly be used for that. Um, a combination camera of a natural color image and a multi-spectral image looking at specific bandwidth related not only to surface oil distribution, but um, the film uh, that will tend to expand over time after a surface oil spill. You'll have the heavier part particles of uh, uh, the liquid um, raw oil settling down into the water, but there's a sheen on the water that is uh, if it uh, equally toxic, if not more, uh, than raw oil it, itself, and having a multispectral um, uh, imaging camera um, on board with the natural color at, at the same time um, would be the ideal application. Okay, anything else? Thank you very much.